So welcome everyone. I'm gonna give it another minute and we'll kick it off at 203. Your birds chirping. So thanks for whoever's bringing the birds to the call today. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, let's let's get going here. Um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay, and I use she/her pronouns. I'm joining you from my house, um, situated here on Tutelo and Saponi lands in Franklin County, Virginia. I'm excited to help facilitate this call today alongside Emma Carnes and the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves as well in the chat, um, maybe include uh, a little about what's bringing you here today. Um, I'm going to start with a review of our agenda. Um, so that everyone has an idea of what's going on in the call today. Um, so we're at the top here welcoming you and um, I'll give a quick introduction to Virginia Sen. Um, and then we're gonna talk about democratic group governance. So we'll be in conversation with Ben from the Little Blue Stem Collective and Virginia Progressives. Um, we have PG here with us. Um, that'll be a majority of the call, and then we'll take a few minutes break, um, and then we'll come back for a full group discussion to make connections and kind of weave everything together that we're learning, um, and then we'll have um, just a quick closing and some different ways that uh, we can stay in touch with each other. So fairly straightforward agenda, but wanted to make sure everyone feels comfortable and, and knows where we're headed. Um, so the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network supports, educates, and connects people striving to build a more resilient and equitable economy based on shared values that put people and planet over private profits and power. We're a group of people and organizations from across the state that have been coming together for the last couple of years now um, to imagine and define what alternative economic systems look like, systems that are built on community well being. And to really ground ourselves in the history and frameworks developed by Black and Indigenous communities who are and have been building these systems here in our region and beyond. So we've been learning from the Highlander Center, from Emily Kawano and the US Solidarity Economy Network, Mike Strode with Open Collective Foundation and the Colonut Collaborative, Duran Chavez and the Maggie Walker Land Trust, Chris Newman and Sylvan Aqua Farms and so many others. As an emerging network, we're exploring group governance and decision-making structures that reflect our values of cooperation and shared power. And one of the values of solidarity economy is defined as many paths. So we know there are lots of ways to reach collective liberation. And in the context of today's call, lots of ways to organize and govern ourselves through mutual respect, cooperation, and shared power. Um, and it's also in the spirit of collective learning and mutual aid that we're here today. Um, we know that we all have so much to offer each other. Uh, we want to learn from you and with you. So we're asking questions like what works and what doesn't when it comes to democratic group governance. How does collaborating in this way help us build the world that we want to live in? 
Um, so we hope that this conversation seeds connections, that you meet new people, that you offer your experiences to the group and ask for what you need as well. Um, so with that, I want to invite you all to just take a few deep breaths to kind of land here in this virtual space and settle in. We're scheduled uh, to go until 3.30 today, so about an hour and a half. Um, and we want you to, to participate in whatever way feels most authentic to you. So whether that's with your camera on or off um, by asking questions and sharing reflections in the chat, or you can also use the um, raise hand feature. I think we're a small enough group as well that you can feel free to just come off mute and, and respond. This is an interactive conversation. Um, yeah, so let's take just a, a couple deep breaths. Um, I feel myself going fast. So I'm going to slow down here. Okay. Um, and again, I do want to let you know that we're recording this session today as a way to archive this conversation and to share um, the wisdom with folks that couldn't be here live with us. So if you have questions or concerns about that, um, we definitely want to respect, respect that. So feel free to send me a message in the chat. Um, and with that, I, I'll pass it to you, Emma. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for that introduction and for helping us get situated together here so we can make the most of our time together. Uh, welcome, Barbara and Todd. Um, so my name is Emma Carnes, and I am a member of the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network. And along with Lindsay, I will be facilitating the conversation today um, between Ben with Little Bluestone Cooperative, PG representing Virginia progressives, and uh, some input from Matthew as well representing Virginia Solidarity Economy Network. So I think that without further ado, I'll have our speakers go ahead and introduce themselves. So um, if you could just briefly tell us who you are, a little brief, briefly about the organization you're here representing, and then um, to kind of launch us, tell us in a few sentences how you define democracy within your organization. I can drop those three things in the chat for reference. Um, but let's maybe start with Ben and then we'll go to PG and then Matthew. Thanks, Emma, and thanks, Lindsay, on the fort. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you should be good. Great. Um, so my name is Ben Kessler. I'm a worker member with the Little Blue Stem Collective. Uh, the formal designation cooperative LC that helps uh, Ben, unfortunately we're losing you. Okay. How about now? Now we got you. Um, so we are a, a nonprofit, basically, that works in partnership with Virginia Organizing to uh, educate and distribute about local genotype native plants and being right by the landscape more generally. What's the question? What, uh, how do we define democracy? Something like that? Yep. The question is, how do you define democracy in your organization? Yeah. So that is, so democracy is. Honestly, we, we throw it around kind of informally. We use it interchangeably with collectivism, which is maybe more of a, a motivating for us. And that is any mode of organization includes the, addresses the needs of all those affected by the decision-making of a lot more under the hood that makes that attainable. enough yeah that was great uh thanks ben 
PG, do you want to jump in? Sure. I am PG. I'm with Virginia Progressives. We are an organization that emerged uh, out of electoral politics, but it really was electoral politics rooted in grassroots organizing, starting in Western Virginia. You can see our, our website here and the democratic processes are in, uh, the democratic processes with which we've experimented are in our points of unity. And in particular, some of the, the technologies that we've used to try to attain that kind of uh, process within our organization. So how do we think of democracy within our organization? We uh, tend to focus on building capacity so that people can have agency in the things that affect their lives. And that's been a structuring principle for for our organization. And uh, I would say that's our approach to democracy. And thank you for having us on here. Thank you, PG. And Matthew, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Matthew Slats here. Um, um, I got to say, Lindsay did just an eloquent like intro at the beginning about VASN, um, but I know some of you are just coming on. Um, but you know, VASN, a Virginia Solidarity Economy Network, is just a, is an effort to kind of think about an alternative economy in Virginia. Um, and so it's a group of grassroots organizers that have been coming together um, to meet and talk and think together, um, much like this meeting is a, is a great example of, of that work. Um, since democracy is such a, a big piece of the solidarity economy, both values globally, um, um, it's something that we've been thinking about a lot. Because um, um, we talk when we talk to people, there's there's like this there's always this desire or, or this there's like a shared value of like democracy. I mean, we live so we live in the U.S. where that's that's a that's a value it's talked about, but. I think there's the big question of like, how is it actually practiced? Um, and I think that's something we've been trying to figure out. Um, um, Cause we've been such a small group. Um, Democracy is kind of easier in some ways, I think. Um, but um, really like about, I mean, thinking a lot about like shared leadership right at the moment um, and making sure as many voices have a, have a space in the conversation as possible. Awesome, thank you. So uh, moving forward, we have some guiding questions prepared to move us through the conversation, but we'll also pull from the chat. And so um, we want everyone to feel like they can engage in free flowing conversation as much as that's generative and productive. Uh, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat as they come up, uh, raise your hands and or just come off of mute. Like Lindsay said, we're a pretty small group. So we can, I think we can be flexible in how we all engage. Um, I will start us off with a question. And I wonder if um, PG, maybe you can start us off. And we'll just hear from the different speakers, their responses and go from there. Uh, so the question is, how do you delegate work within your organization? Great. We've been through ebbs and flows in the size of our organization, ranging from about 80 active participants down to making sure there's a meeting in a given week. So the, the, the methods for delegating work have, have varied over time, but one of the things that's been consistent throughout has been a rotation of tasks. Uh, key among those being the facilitation. That's something we've always been able to rotate. And that's kept that, that underlying current. When we've had uh, larger participation, we've extended that to technical aspects such as hosting. We've had multiple backup uh, Zoom and other hosting platforms so that there would be multiple redundancy in our systems and we wouldn't be dependent on any, on any one particular individual. We uh, try to run 
efficient meetings. That's been a challenge, and that's a question we might throw back to the group. But one of the uh, ways that we've made sure the tasks get done has been delegating to work uh, committees to working groups and then having having working meetings to carry those forward in which we have as an explicit goal to try to uh, to try to do skill sharing and to be uh, raising uh, people's people's skills at every uh, at every opportunity we try to avoid somebody being good at all things internally in our group there's a one big caveat there in which in that we do have some very particular and historic expertise in our organization. So trying to trying to bring everybody up to that level has been a, an ongoing process for us. Thank you, Ben. Do you want to jump in? How does that compare to Little Blue Stem in your delegation of work? Sure, yeah, it's pretty similar. Um, just kind of two branches, and I would I would love to get into framework of meeting structure at some point. Now, briefly, we have a, a project-based process for getting stuff done, all voluntary. So through the decision-making process of our meetings, which it, uh, project lead is declared. Um, nobody volunteers to do the thing, then we're not doing the project the enthusiasm to get it done we're going to need to right there there's already a layer who's in who's first we've tried to do working groups in the past where there's a there we all agree it's the thing that needs seems to have enjoyable tasks like raised from the accountability. So with the project, the project lead will look at the work that needs to be done and figure out and say, hey, I'm going to need to help me out Monday uh, for, or I need somebody to get this whatever the task is group yeah but Ben, ben I'm sorry to cut you we're right, really you having mean. trouble hearing you that audio is terrible here today um how far, <laughs> where did you lose me? <laughs> We're in and out. That part, that was great. Maybe it's just a matter of holding the phone really close or something. Okay. Yeah, um, for now. So individual, individual project leads rather than group leads, uh, rather than a, a group designated. Um, and we can talk about how that accountability structure works into framework for our meetings. But essentially, the project lead determines how much assistance they're going to need, quest assistance from other folks. If you're assisting the project lead, you're basically following their direction on the project. And obviously, suggestions input are always welcome. Um, but the lead is the, the alpha and the omega of the project. Um, and sometimes we'll have dual leads for, um, but assistance could look like editing support for a document. Um, it could look like um, where some of plants at a school. Yeah, we, we've lost you again, Ben. God damn, okay. <laughs> um, is there perhaps a different way you could call in that might work better? I just have the one ancient okay. phone. Uh, 
I don't have a lot of surveillance devices in my life. <laughs> just one that works very badly. <laughs> uh, I just wonder if call uh, me in by the phone instead of like to the um, Zoom phone option might work better than than going in over the internet to Zoom. I think it's the same line, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I can try cutting out and calling back in again on a different line because it looks like there's a couple numbers there. Yeah, why don't you give that a shot? Um, okay, cool. But thank Very you. Honest. We got a good. We got a good chunk of it. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. Hopefully that works. Um, in the meantime. Let's get uh, Matthew's perspective on work delegation. Yeah, um, it's a it's an ongoing like process. Um, um, like when we started, we like because it was basically me and Daniel Wagner and a few others. I think like Barbara, you were there early on and. Lindsay, you came in not too much longer after, and I think we were really trying to find ways to share um, to share the 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 conversation, the leadership in the conversation. So I think you know, early on we did try to like have people, different people, lead meetings, um, and um, and with different successes. Um, I mean, there was so much going on that this was in 2020. Um, so like when the fall came and the election, like just sucked the air out of the room. Um, we lost a lot of people because um, their focus was on, on electoral work. Um, so so we kept uh, trying to kind of share share that as much as possible. But then also like just needing to kind of keep a rhythm and um, keep like keep meetings happening on a regular schedule and you know, being responsive to people. Um, I mean, I know in the, like one of my goals, which I think I know not everybody loves this, but I, I, I try not to set um, agenda, try to keep space in every meeting to set agendas um, so that we may have some pieces of an agenda um, ahead of time, but then like always leaving space open for others to kind of, you know, Feed, give feedback and provide information um, that they th think is important. And maybe it's a topic that wants to come forward in the group. So always kind of keeping space open for that has been a big, a big thing. Um, but also trying to can keep conversations moving forward if we have a project that we're working on. Um, so some of the things Ben was saying about, about um, having projects and I'll say we did try early on to kind of use a sociocracy, like a circle based process. And I think it was just, uh, we're a small group. It was like, it was like 10, 12 of us. And I think ha trying to create circles, we, we, we actually like voted on and talked about creating circles, but I think we just, how do you hold them um, and make them um, sustainable was, has always been a big question. And we've always kind of just diverted back to like having a weekly meeting. Um, um, and so lots of different explorations and to see what happens. And, um, um, it's great as of late, we've been moving with this kind of like shared leadership model where every, every week, some, a different, a different person holds the, holds the meeting. So, um, I'm grateful for that. Cause I think we've gotten into a rhythm with that and now it's like, okay, what, like maybe how do we take that to a next step? Yeah, thanks. I heard a lot of um, references in all of those answers to that trade-off between, you know, inclusive participatory democracy and efficiency uh, in terms of the organization meeting its objectives. Um, and Ben, Ben gestured at maybe ha of having frameworks that were specifically designed to mitigate that trade-off and you know make non-hierarchical decision making more efficient. Uh, I'll throw that back to the three of you and wondering if you can talk about um, the trade-offs you see in your own organizations in terms of efficiency, you know, when is that worthwhile, when is it not, and then what are some tools you've used to 
to mitigate the loss of efficiency. And I'll, whoever has the answer first can go ahead and jump in. Well, this is um, something that I suppose will come up eventually. And it is an aspect of efficiency. It's an aspect of getting work done. The one of the um, being involved in the electoral realm to some extent, uh, we we encounter issues of power, external issues of power, and those lead to conflict. So this is uh, this is a place where where we where we came through some challenges and had to innovate. Or had to explore some structures for um, for hitting that trade off. So I shared uh, a bit ago, and let me share again my screen and show you where where we had started with intention. So you have here a a polis poll, and initially we we tried doing that to as a as a catalyst to find to find consensus and to explore shared and common ideas. And that was indicative of the, the way we were going for a while. But uh, then we, um, we encountered this. If you look in the red here, you'll see that we were, we were close to having a consensus on some key ideas, but you see three people. <laughs> um, and th this is conflict. So what we, what we ended up having to do was to fall back on some clear bylaws that could support voting. And we, um, one of the things that we had to, that we had to wrestle with was, well, what did we agree? What did we decide? What did we decide last meeting? So we needed some method for carrying forward and being able to say, this is what we decided in the face of people, I think we could pretty safely say in bad faith, challenging that. Uh, we, had to, we had to form and assert a kind of an identity. So for that, we, we ended up exploring Robert's rules. And um, that was okay for uh, coming up with traces in our minutes, which we, we kept minutes in a particular place so we could track from meeting to meeting what we had decided. And the way we would indicate what we had decided would, was through votes. Now we, we rode through some of those storms that were existential challenges to the organization. And now we still have votes and minutes, but our votes are always unanimous <laughs> over the months and months but it does help us to remember what we've decided. And so a residue of, of having come through some of that conflict is that it helped us think about and develop structures for keeping track of things. And, and that has been, has been helpful in our, in our reconstituted configuration. Fantastic. Um, is the sound coming through now? Yes, I think it's fingers crossed much better. I like it. All right, cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much for bringing up uh, record keeping. That's uh, that is essential. There needs to be a paper trail for everything forever, always. <laughs> Otherwise, stuff just doesn't get done. For us, um, I actually find census decision making more efficient than hierarchical decision making, taking in kind of the broader cost of everything from uh, resentment to time wasted twiddling your thumbs to waiting on supervisors to all of the many, many, many information disjuncts that occur anytime in a hierarchy, uh, you know, because when violence is violence is the fundamental motivating mode as it is in a hierarchy, no matter how pleasantly the face is, economic violence is the threat for not doing the thing you said you were going to do. That leads to information loss. 
that information loss can be crippling. So for our internal organization, which is kind of a, a distillate or a Frankenstein's hodgepodge, depending on how you look at it, of Quaker consensus decision-making foundation stuff from the Sustainable Economies Law Center out west, stuff from the ACORN or H-Shield model of problematic earth, uh, earth skills, primitive skills, um, event management, and good old-fashioned commune living. Um, we have come upon a meeting framework that we find to be extraordinarily efficient, and I'm happy to just lay out the blueprint for that right now. It shouldn't take too long. Is that okay with folks? Yeah, I think that'd be great. Cool. So every meeting has designated roles. Every single meeting has somebody in these roles. There's not a leadership role. Meetings aren't, nobody really leads the meeting. Um, facilitator role, which is part of it, is not the person in charge of the meeting. It's just one of the roles. In a small group, everybody takes responsibility for the functioning of before the meeting even begins, the agenda maker writes the agenda. Um, so a, at least, ideally, we want to have agendas written about a week out. Realistically, um, they can be as close as two days or the day before, but they're usually, you know, the, the goal is to have the agenda out with enough time for everybody to read it, understand it, comment on it, add to it, subtract, through it, subtract from it when necessary, so that we don't waste any time when we're gathered figuring out what we're going to talk about. We don't schedule meetings to inform each other. That's what email is for. We schedule meetings to decide things. If a meeting meanders into a place where somebody is announcing something new, we ask them to please shut up, <laughs> send us an email about it, and let's get on with the decision-making process of what we had agreed we were going to talk about that day. And then if there's time at the end, then maybe we can introduce the meeting. We're not going to waste our time scheduled and gathered together to basically read an email out loud. So the agenda setter sets the agenda, and this is the important part, puts a time for every single item on the agenda, five-minute increments. A little bit of flex time because some things, like check-ins, shouldn't take more than three or four minutes. If longer than that, again, look at what you can do outside of those meetings. Um, so five-minute increments, agenda. Then in person, the facilitator is the person who watches the vibes of the meeting, sees where people are at, makes sure that folks more or less stay on target, notices who is being quiet because they're resentful, notices who is being quiet because they didn't read the agenda and they're feeling a little ashamed, notices who is quiet because they're just having a rough day or whatever, and adjusts the flow accordingly. They're the ones who call breaks when breaks need to be called. The facilitator is not the boss of the meeting, and indeed, the facilitator should be somebody who has as little stake as possible in any of the subjects being discussed. They are contributing the least of anybody in the meeting. Their goal, is, their role is entirely procedural. They are just there to ensure that the meeting itself functions. All of these roles are, are rotating. They're all voluntary. The role needs to be filled. Somebody's got to do it. Uh, facilitator is probably the least, uh, least desired role because it's the most work and so there's leadership taken care of right there, made it undesirable. Next is the timekeeper, and the timekeeper is the bad cop to the facilitator's good cop. They are there to make sure that we stay on time, and if the facilitator is getting wordy, they're the one to check and balance them. Simple, and it's desirable, and everybody wants to be the timekeeper because you don't need Then there's the note taker. That's pretty self-explanatory. We tend to take notes right on the agenda document uh, of what we were talking about and then commentary underneath of it. Everybody's got their own style. They're all different. They're all fine. The one thing that we need to, that we make sure every note taker does is anytime somebody says, yeah, I got that. I will take responsibility for that. The note taker pipes up and says, great. Who are you and when will you have that thing done by? So when are you going to start the task and when are you going to have the task completed? That gives the rest of us a sense of when we need to follow up with this person who has essentially volunteered to be a project lead or whatever volunteered to send this email to follow up with this lead to 
talk to this podcast guest, whatever it is we're deciding, putting that timeline in the notes along with the name, we know who and when the thing needs to be done. Lastly, the most important member of the meeting is the snack bearer. Every meeting should have snacks. So they're responsible for getting vittles, bringing them, and serving them. All meetings are an hour, not one minute more. Uh, there's always a snack, and there's usually a break in the middle for us. Human beings, especially in these technologically distracted days, aren't really great at focusing on anything for more than 45 minutes at a stretch, and usually that. So, agenda maker needs to keep that in mind as they form the agenda. The timekeeper keeps that in mind. Now, the snack bearer makes that file for everybody. Wrap will usually follow up afterwards with a flurry of emails detailing what we said we were going to do, when we said we were going to do it by request, if it's going to be a while between meetings for everybody to do a book report of what we've done on projects we're working on um, that our time together is spent just focused. That's meetings in a nutshell. Thank you, Ben. That was really informative. Um, since that was so much information, I'll leave a second if anybody has follow-up questions, clarifications, any questions at all uh, about what all up Ben just shared and feel free to raise your hand or come off of mute. Uh, yes, Nathaniel. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, that was really, really cool. Um, I, I know here at Mason, we're always holding meetings and we're trying to figure out, you know, a structure that is both effective and democratic. Um, I was curious if you have that kind of structure, Ben, if you have that structure down in writing and if it's something that could maybe be made accessible to us. Um, I did take some notes, but, you know, having all those details laid out would be, uh, would be really cool. Yeah, no problem. We have it in, uh, exhaustive and incomprehensible detail in our bylaws, but I can, I can translate that into, into regular human speech and, uh, and send some to the organizers for distribution. I would be super grateful for that. Um, but if, if it's too much, uh, and the bylaw, bylaws are just on your website? Uh, no, they are, they're in internal documents because our advisory circle, which I haven't even talked about yet, is uh is still pouring over them i'll uh it's no trouble at all i'll just i'll write this up and send it in in the next couple of days 100 percent. well i appreciate that thank you ben no whoever's on notes get me stick me to that <laughs> yeah and, and uh this is also recorded and will be on our website so if that's an easier way to reference information it'll be there as well Uh, Lisa has a quick question in the chat. She said she didn't hear who follows up after meetings. Ah, um, that is pretty much anybody who is project lead or project support on any of the projects discussed in a meeting. Model where basically if you suggest a thing, you're you're pretty much volunteering to be on the hook for it. Um, they're not always. And project lead is bottom lining a project. They're asking for support where they need it. Um, Project supports usually follow up with project leads to make sure that the project is going on. And so it's a, it's a different person, not a designated meeting role, since not everybody needs to be podcast crew. We're pretty self-contained. We don't need to involve everybody from the finance crew in all of our internal decision making. So that's just. Thank you. So, oh, Lindsay. Yeah, I don't see my raise hand feature, so I'll actually <laughs> raise my hand here. Um, but Ben, I was wondering too, is it the role of the facilitator then to call 
or to say when a decision is being made. I, I feel like in the meetings that I'm on, like we tend to just talk. It, we, we tend to have the meetings where you said we could just have an email for it instead, where we're like sharing information that could have been shared via email. And we th- will like throw out ideas um and it's like yeah yeah that's a good idea but then but then it's like that how do you move to okay we're is it's if three people think it's a good idea is it a decision like how do we move to the next steps rather than talking in circles like that's one of my facilitator challenges that um sounds like y'all have figured out here yeah Great question. Um, A lot of that honestly comes down to the agenda maker for framing the the sorts of things that we'll be talking about in such a way that decision points are emergent. So, um, for instance, if we're talking about, say, um, we had a conversation the other day about what kind of merchandise we would be producing and selling, and the rather than saying, framing it as um, agenda point, what sort of merchandise should we be producing? The agenda maker in that case did a little bit of research and said, all right, here are some options that we can talk about. We can talk about printing t-shirts. We can talk about printing bandanas. We can talk about uh, some printed materials or some other stuff too. But by presenting that discussion point in an already slightly curtailed way, the conversation we had wasn't a pure brainstorm. It was an evaluation of which of the proposed models looked like they would be viable. And if we got to a point where none of the proposed models looked like they'd be viable, that's when we'd go into brainstorm mode. Does that help at all? Yeah, for sure. That's helpful. Thank you. But yeah, yeah. also designating the difference between a brainstorm and a decision is helpful. And again, the time limit there helps. Like we're going to brainstorm on this for 10 minutes and then we'll go back to making decisions about other things, take a pin in this and return to it as a decision point. Yeah, that's a really um, helpful distinction, brainstorming proposals. Um, Does Virginia Progressives and our VA send, uh, curious to hear if, if those processes look different in terms of actually coming to implementing, stamping a decision, um, or if you, you'd say those organizations follow similar suit. So I'll say, I think we've been, we've been like a little, I mean, not that I don't think the process is, I was going to use the term rigid, but I don't think like it's, it's sometimes structure is important, right? Like to, to make things happen in a good process, but um i think that making i mean so much of like since we're a network of people spread across virginia and like none of us is actually in the same room together um pretty much i don't think we ever have been all of us have been in the same room together um the 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 meeting spaces are actually a space a space to just to be in a room together um and the, the value of as like i think emily her someone quoted emmy quano on our like um, like building trust is about work, like doing work together. So I, I think like using the meetings as working spaces where we are talking about ideas or if someone, something comes up, like the group of us can sit down and like, oh, well, let's shift the, where, the what, or what we were doing and go in. So leaving some of that flexibility to kind of shift. Um, but that's because I think we're in a network, like we're a different organizational function than what, what Ben is doing. Um, um and kind of having that space to be responsive i think is is important um i'll say on the decision making processes like the the thing that we have done in the past some things are on the fly a little bit getting based on kind of immediate needs or they may they may be they emerge out of out of something we've done together um thinking back to to like the fact that we wrote this principles and value statement and our and our kind of like our our over like last fall, but that emerged from us like being like, do we want to apply for money? Like, is that something we want to do? Um, 
like there's this grant and ask these questions. So like we use the gr the grant writing process, although we didn't submit it as a as a as a process to like start to like lay some of those things down on, a, on the table together. And then from that, we decided to move forward with a kind of a bigger in initiative. And I think a lot of things have been kind of emergent like that. Um, but then I think there's other moments where um, coming out of out of this training we did with Highlander back in the f spring of last year, like a bunch of us said, well, what do we want to do um, together as a next step? What's a tangible thing we could do together? And we we have kind of all decided on doing this mapping process. But then what we did was that like a small group got together, created a proposal that then we submitted back to the group about about this action. Um, so we wrote like, get a one page little proposal, put it back to the group, then the group could like revise it and develop it and, and make changes to that. So that took over took took place over a little like a few weeks. And then we synthesized everything um, that came in from from the various pieces. Um, um, and then that kind of like cohesive thing then went back to the group for a vote. And and the vote is is never a yes or a no. It's always like a yes, no, and you know, I have other feedback um, in the process. So again, I think I don't think we're always the best at like keeping really solid notes, but like there's always like a way of a feedback mechanism in everything we do so that if people has if someone has a differing opinion, um, that we can make sure that that's that's talked about and discussed and heard in ways that um, is is helps inform future efforts. Thanks, Matthew. Um, considering the forty five minute attention span we just learned about, we are coming up on that. I wanted to give PG the last word on this topic in case you have one before we take a quick break. Uh, mo mostly to to affirm what what Matthew was seeing uh, that it sounds to me like Ben you have a different kind of organization where there are certain tasks that are happening day to day on the ground and then the meetings happen in that context we similarly kind of a hybrid between VA Sen and uh, and your group uh, are to a very large extent a post COVID phenomenon we are a Zoom organization. Uh, so our meetings do have a component which is the on the ground together we generally like to try to adjourn our formal meeting and then have that time together be run on after the meeting but uh, when we've had larger strength we've uh, we've tended to do something like uh, the structure that you present about the the accountability resonates because when we've when we've done votes and in our prehistory as well, they've um, we've tried to think of them as a show of strength. How many hands on deck do we have to get this done? Rather than we're going to bind ourselves to a to a coercively to a decision in this way. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, as we then went to Zoom. Uh, now we've started to be in a position where our numbers are big enough again that we're projecting presence on the ground. And a part of our philosophy, a part of our approach to decisions is somebody has an idea. How can we get behind it? How can we help them succeed? And that's been internally kind of our guiding principle. And now as we project out to other groups that we're aligned with acting on the ground, we bring the same kind of thing. How can we go there and make their uh, their event a success? Um, and a part of that is some of, sometimes just the solidarity, the psychic support. It's it's emotional work to chair the meeting each time, to be the, the accountable, responsible person. And we've evolved to kind of have a sensitivity to that and to try to think around that. Wonderful. Good. Oh, go ahead. Throw in one last two cents uh, as far as what our particular this particular structure of meeting is used for. Um, I have used this this structure of multiple roles in a meeting with realized note taking, follow up, etc. In everything from running a summer camp, uh, which includes figuring out um, what sorts of things are appropriate to 
introduce as new educational things for the kids to what should we serve kitchen this year to uh, big, broad philosophical discussions about the way that uh, Quaker school that I was working at the time, for instance, would address issues of ability and mobility access to very nitty gritty concrete stuff like um, who's going to print the t-shirts for the merch table at the plant sale this weekend. So this is definitely not something that is strictly strictly um, related to daily or weekly um, progress report type stuff. It is, it is scalable to more philosophical roles as well, for whatever that's worth. Great, thank you. I think we will take a 10 minute break if that feels right to folks, uh, take a breather. When we come back together for another 20 or 25 minutes, we can um, ask any more questions that came to mind, uh, reflect a little bit as a group and talk about tangible next steps that organizations can take that are interested in democratic governance. So thanks everybody and we'll come back around 3.03. Hi, yeah, hi Mona, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, I invite everyone else to come on back. And if your camera's off, maybe just drop us a little note in the chat so we, we know that we're all good to go. Um, ben, do we have you here? I don't see your phone number anymore. He's coming back in right now. Oh, okay, cool. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, I thought that we could start, I would start by opening the floor to any questions for any of our speakers that we have. See a hand, Todd, go ahead. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much uh, for having this, this meeting. It's really uh, a great topic. And thank you PG for putting it uh, into the Slack channel for the Deck Collective. That's the only way I would have found out about this meeting. but. My question is for all of the speakers who spoke about their organizations and the way they manage things. My question is in relation to the modes of communication that they use, like which social media channels that they prefer. I know PG, you mentioned psychic support. So I wanted to know like which channels do you prefer for that psychic support and where does the buck stop in terms of whether you're using Zoom or Slack or Facebook, and how do you keep in check these different platforms? Because they're, they are their own companies, and in many ways, some of these companies are dictating the policies of the country. So how do you keep that in check? How do you decide which channels to use? That's my question. Yes, yeah, so we, we had a very deliberate process around that. It, and we have through, throughout from the times uh, we were just introducing Mona, who was here with previous formations going back to 2013 almost. Um, we, we tried to stay away from the big companies. So instead of using Slack, we use Zulip. Uh, that's, that's one of our, our big you know, strikes against those. In terms of social media, we don't use Facebook. People say everybody is, is, that's where everybody is. And so you have to be there as an organizer. We have a feeble presence there. We use Hootsuite to try to get an official voice out through Twitter, through both Facebook, which we have very little presence on. And Twitter, we're a little more present on Twitter, but um, not, not much. It's mostly, and now we have tried to use Jitsi is an alternative to Zoom and Virginia Solidarity Economy. I'll, I'll defer to Matthew on that. In the early days when we tried it out, we had pretty serious bandwidth problems. So we ended up shifting away from that. 
and we do use Zoom. So Zoom is our primary to answer your question about where that emotional support comes in. We try to eat together on Zoom. Thank you, Barbara, right on cue. Um, uh, that, that tends to be our main sort of lifeline. But yeah, thank you for those questions. And so excited to have Debt Collective on here. And I hope that we can hear a little more from you about your, uh, how you make your, how, you, how things work in your organization. Um, yeah, we have a pretty minimal um, social media existence. Um, we use telephones, mail, and in person. That's about it. Um, we do get a lot of mileage out of the Google Drive cloud storage platform. Um, that's handy for editing documents. Take a document, somebody else can edit it. I work with Dropbox in the past. Uh, Google Drive has gotten to be a little bit more efficient. Um, obviously, we do not discuss anything remotely confidential or incriminating or politically oriented in any way, shape, or form on any form of computer or internet mandated media. Um, own name for this? <laughs> I forgot the technical term for it. It's not data security. Um, operational security? Damn. Wow. Some activist I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, no, we um, we uh, do as much as we can in person. Um, if we were to have a conversation, say, about partnership with any of the organizations that have resisted pipeline construction in Virginia, for instance, we would have that conversation in person with our telephones in the car, and we would record all of our notes on pen and paper. OPSEC is uh, is the name of the game. Other stuff, you just have to assume that your your mail is being read and your papers are being checked, and in such a way that is appropriate. All of the various readers, guys. <laughs> yeah, nope. Don't use social stuff other than at. PG, go ahead. Uh, yeah, on operational security, I did. I did neglect to mention we 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 also don't use WhatsApp. We had used what used WhatsApp for a while. There were more people there. It was kind of a, a nightmare in a number of ways. Uh, but we do we do use Signal, and we have used Signal with disappearing messages uh, when discussing some sensitive issues overseas. But yeah, that I mean, if we can do it. You know, a walk in the park, that's that's the way, uh, but we're mostly online. Um, in terms of VSN, so, I mean, we use, well, <laughs> we've got, um, uh, well, a few things. One thing I think we, for the beginning, we were like intentionally not about, this was not about getting a huge group of people together. Um, it was like, how do we get a core group of people together and work from that core group? Um, like conversations about, um, you know, do we, do we invite politicians to the table? And the answer was no. Like we decided like, we don't want them at the table. Like they're just gonna suck the space, the air out of the room. So um, we had conversations about Facebook and whatnot. We never, I, I mean, maybe we have done something, but it's not at all active in any way. Um, um so like the biggest thing that we've done is we like, collectively decided to start using slack um which has its problems um as a platform um but it's something that's been kind of working for most of us i think again we just recognize that not everybody's going to use it um so it's kind of more of an internal conversation organizing piece um i've used Lu things like lumio and some of those other platforms um those are um Again, it's always like the it's always like what is the what's the learning curve that we need to overcome to get people to kind of start using it, um, which is always the big question. It's like that's why everybody defaults to Facebook because it's everybody knows it. And but I would say that another conversation that a few of us had, I don't think we had it like broadly, was like 
um, just like transparency, right? Like, like, do we need to worry about, um, you know, people reading our messages? Do we have anything to hide? And so it's like, do you try to like hide it behind things or do we just, are we just as transparent as possible? Um, but that also has limits. So that's a conversation that's been brought forward, but we're just started to use uh, groups.io as a, as a, um, as a like a, a group chat listserv kind of platform because there's some other groups in the US that are using it around solidarity economies. Um, um, I love to get off of Google, but it's kind of there, it's easy. Um, I've been playing with this other system called um, openweb.systems, which is a non, it's a non, um, of a non-corporate, um, it's called Nextcloud. Um, it's been a little bit buggy though, so I haven't really gone whole hundred percent. And we just, we haven't we don't have the like I would love to move us to something like on an internet process to use that, but like we're still a, kind of a ragtag group of people, so we don't have the infrastructure or the funding to do that yet. But maybe there's a future where that's something we look towards. Um, and then the last thing is that, and we haven't jumped. To this because we've been talking about like what does it mean to do a kind of fiscal sponsorship so we do can rewrite we can raise money and organize our, our fu funds um is that we've been in touch with this group called open collective foundation which has like an open transparent financial um platform um but we haven't made a jump on that yet i think we, we all have to decide still if that's what we feel is right um versus a kind of a more of a, a local based kind of thing, a statewide thing. So, um, so that those are those are the platforms that we're using at the moment. I, I, I wish there was like a moment where a bunch of people could come together and just like we could do a big sharing. <laughs> Maybe that's an, another learn in, right? Like organize, like online organizing. Um, what what do you what is everybody using? Because it would be great to hear like how what people are using, how they they feel it's effective. Yeah, in that spirit, I, I think now is a good time um, just to open up the floor. And I, if anyone who hasn't uh, gotten the chance to share about, to join the conversation or share about their organization that they're coming from, uh, if you want to share any reflections or anything you heard today that um, is reflected in your own experience and has worked well, or so you've tried something different that's worked well, um, yeah, I would love to hear what organizations are here and, and what other insights you all bring. I'm just curious to throw out the, to the knowledge in the room, like, are the things that we've been talking about, like, are they, for those of you that maybe that have been organizing a little bit longer than some of us, like, are these conversations like, oh, we've been, you, you all been talking about these for ages. And so this is really nothing new. Um, I'm always curious to hear, hear people who, who, who've been in the, in the struggle, talk a little bit about how they've done things or or because I, because I, I do think I, like this is what's wonderful to hear about from 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 blue little blue stem is is like if we're gonna move to this new economy we've got to build and this is what I think is valuable about talking hearing from from Virginia progressives is like the practice of doing this is a big is a big piece of this like you building these habits building this memory and this knowledge of how this goes because it feels like we're always reinventing it but. I'm sure it's been done for a long time. <laughs> so I'd love to hear anybody's experience on that. I can talk for a brief moment while folks are Testing their thoughts about a little bit of Quaker history, which is where a lot of the, the formation of this stuff comes from. Quakers have been 
organizing themselves non-hierarchically for at least 600 years, utilizing their uh, model of facilitation, yeah, of a distributed facility as a permanent role, or has been around long before Quakers as declaring as Quakers, and they were just. That at least seems like folks that we ain't tried to fix. We're losing you, Ben, if you could. Oh, I was done. I, I just uh, distributed facilitatorship over 600 years old, Quaker tradition, dates from before. William Penn and the Fancy Pants Quakers kind of took it across the sea, but old uh, old Northern English crofter self-organization, um, the communities on the downs. In not good at English geography, so I'm not even going to try to say where it was, but uh, in England, sheep herders uh, formerly managing common land that was then enclosed upon the enclosures movement where common land was divvied up among the local nobility. Uh, facilitate um, cash extraction. Anyway, uh, a lot of the Quaker self-organization come from that legacy of management of the commons for the world. So, sold. So we can move into our closing section here, unless I'll leave a couple seconds if anyone has final questions or comments. I have another question if folks are open to it. Um, um, let me collect it for a second. One thing I'm thinking about that, um, and I'm speaking again from my um, organizing experience with, with my paid work. I work as a coordinator with an alliance of organizations that um, on our bylaws, we have sort of a non-hierarchical structure and a lot of our work takes place in like a, a steering committee is our leadership body. Um, we have work teams and this was um, kind of where I've done most of my facilitating and the challenges I mentioned before of like not having a designated or hierarchical leader has been like it's it it looks good on paper and then in practice it can be really challenging or um or just to be real like as the staff person it feels like a lot falls on me like when we were talking about meeting structure I'm like oh I why am I having all of these roles um and maybe that's why our meetings aren't feeling efficient because one person is trying to do too many things. Um, and so it's just making me think about where or how do you all incorporate like feedback structures into your organization so that when something feels like it's not working, there's like a point of intervention or some opportunity to, to evaluate and assess like, is this, is what we're doing working for everyone? So not just with meeting structure, but just kind of internal organizing generally, where are those feedback loops and opportunities? So for us, it's a pretty constantly iterative process. Uh, enough group that everybody has ample time space within all of our collective patients to express themselves at length when they need to um, and we do most of that is uh, either at the end well it's a it's part of the facilitator's role who is who is really in the meeting gaining the sense of the meeting quicker term there and writing things from there if there is a sense of tension then 
may be that the agenda needs to be shelved for the moment while we have a touchy feely conversation so that we can really get our efficiency back up to get back to the damn work, but also have a pleasant time with one another and love and respect each other, et cetera. Um, so because none of us are boss, we have the flexibility to change the I like that. Uh, properly, what usually happens after a in-depth check-in like that is we'll reschedule the decision, deciding things meeting for some time in the next couple of days, and then include as agenda items the proposals for how to address the procedural changes the district doing in that moment. Sometimes it's just we're all just having a bad day and there's nothing. Called the meeting early and plug a few walk in the woods. So fluidly, but anything that requires decision, that requires action, still budgeted in terms of time, tracked in terms of Just oops. just to get to your kind of follow up on the VSN kind of response, it's it's always been really interesting that like I'm just like taking this very small example, like we've moved meeting times around, right? Like meetings were happening on on Tuesdays and Sundays for a while, like every other week, which is a really complicated scheduling and um and that was just to kind of coordinate so that some people could have meetings on on some of people could show up on Sundays and some people couldn't and some people could show up on weeknights. Um, and then we moved to the kind of this regular meeting schedule um, uh, on Fridays. And then someone at a, at a moment where it felt like we were all kind of like finishing something or like there was a moment like that I think someone brought up like, well, what about can we move can we move the schedule to a, to a, to a Tuesday? And so we moved. The meetings and there's always like this transition period um of that happening um i um, even though you know when we when we when we make those decisions ever like the group is kind of like asked um or we do a poll of some sort or um so so i think keeping space open for that um is really important um the other thing that we we, we didn't include in our principles but it's, it did come up um uh, right at the end as we were kind of wrapping that process up was this, it's just this idea of generative conflict. Um, I think, I know I was working with a, a group in, uh, there's this amazing collective black led, um, childcare group in St. Louis that I was in touch with. And they were talking a lot about the importance of, of conflict, right? And conflict is a, is a good thing and it's a part of the process. Um, and so we tried to write this little piece about generative conflict um, and also referencing like groups like I know having read a little bit about like efforts in Barcelona, like they talk all about this idea of confluence. Um, they're not seeking consensus. Um, they're they're recognizing there is going to be disagreement. And so like, how do you create a space where disagreement can be included? Um, and it shouldn't stop you from moving forward. So. Um, um, but we didn't we didn't end up including that because someone didn't had some questions about it and so it, and no it's something that I want to continue to talk about in the future because um, I think it's important to recognize and create space for um, um, but those are some those are some those are some things to say yeah this idea of confluence how do we how do we kind of come together and make decisions and um, and collectively move forward in, in specific ways but doing it, in such a way that allows everybody to get and have to have a voice or a thought in how that moves forward. You know, you, you touch on an important piece that hasn't come up uh, strongly yet, Matthew, in that, and that's something that that Virginia Progressives and its predecessor organizations and then aligned and related organizations has uh, has has dealt with. And um, 
one, one element of feedback, one element of the feedback loop, when our strength has been big enough, has been the, the phone calls, the actual talking to people to get people to come out to the next meeting. And many times those ended up being very lengthy phone calls where a lot of this processing, where, where some of this processing happened. So that's been, that was an informal sort of a channel for doing that. But in terms of, of confluence and um, as opposed to consensus, that's another thing that, that I think we've grown through. We, we have uh, been a part of Occupy processes. We had a long standing, long running Occupy uh, node out here where I am. And that was a part of the processes that informed the prehistory of Virginia for progressives. And there were various techniques coming in this direction from uh, strongly informed by Mennonite traditions. Uh, but where we, where we ended up getting was to, I think, a place where, where conflict is addressed and, and handled in, uh, in a particular way. And I think something that helps us with that in Virginia progressives is we start from a very strong set of points of unity uh, and we, we basically have an onboarding process that, uh, that gets us on the same page starting out, which helps tap into what some of those cultural or religious traditions might implicitly have. And that if you're Quaker, you have a whole book that you share in common. You're really literally on, on the same page. And similarly with, uh, with Mennonite traditions. So what do we have as a, uh, as a, as, a, as a policy oriented organization, what's, what's bringing us together. So we have uh, interactive tutorials on the fundamentals of how a monetary economy works. That's central to our policy thinking. And those run anywhere from three, three hours in a long night or seven, 12 more hours over a span of, of weeks. And some of you in Virginia Solidarity Economy have been through that as well. But that I think puts us in a place where as Virginia progressives, we can move with partner and allied organizations and we can see where they are different and we can understand what, what eventual points of conflict may be, but we can, we can support and we can work in a, in a common direction and then work through those conflicts in a way that's, that's, that's not threatening in a way that ends up, um, it has ended up imploding other types of groups. So we've gotten a little bit of resilience from having a little clarity on that. Thank you, everybody. I have my eye on the time and we're at 329. So I wanna make sure we're respectful of everyone's Sunday afternoons. Um, I think I'll pass it to Lindsay to give us a quick closing, but I do wanna say thank you so much to um, Ben, Matthew and PG and for your question discussion. So thanks and Lindsay will close it up. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I, I'm excited that this conversation um, was so lively today and I hope that we can keep it going. Um, as we've mentioned, the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network is a place for us really to self-organize around what, what you're interested in and what you have to share, what kinds of resources uh, you're looking for. I think this is really a place to meet each other's offers and needs. Um, so if this reminded, if this conversation reminded you of some of your favorite tools or like some of you shared um, resources or organizations that you've learned from, um, let's share that with each other and, and share that across our channels. Uh, we're gonna put in the chat how to join the email listserv and then how to join the Slack channel as well. So that's just two ways to stay in touch. Um, and then of course, if if there was anyone here y'all wanna follow up with, I encourage you to get that information. Um, but thanks so much and hopefully we'll talk to y'all soon. Thank you.
And for anyone that joined late, we do, uh, we were recording today. So you can catch the, the beginning of this. Um, we'll, we'll share the recording and let you know how to access it. Everyone, take care. Everyone. Thank you all.